regulatory and legal issues with blockchain cross borders moderated by Pradeep Goel solve.care with Dr. Franklin Kakia CSB Group Hong Kyun No The Collective C and Marcin Zarakowski Bitcoin Association for BSV Good morning everyone My name is Pradeep Goel I am a healthcare executive from the US it's my honor to be here and to moderate this panel. We have an exceptionally talented and knowledgeable panel, and in 20 minutes, it'll be hard to cover such a large topic of cross-border regulatory environment for blockchain. But I will do my best to give each of the, the panelists an opportunity to share with you their unique perspective. So Dr. Kakia is based here in Malta and runs a CSP group, which is a, um, a regulatory body, and I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, Hong flew in from Korea, and he works with a lot of startups in Korea and helps them deal with the regulatory environment. Marcin Zarkovsky is flown in from Zurich, and he is part of the BSV, uh, the, um, the Blockchain Association for BSV. And then, of course, Dr. Christi uh, Christina Shikul Shikluna. Uh, she works for the Ganado Group, which is another um, advocacy group based here in Malta and deals with a variety of regulatory issues. So let's get started. So maybe we'll start with uh, Christina. Christina, you are involved in a lot of uh, regulatory activity and you serve as an agent for a variety of companies looking to locate themselves in Malta. What are you seeing? Who, is, who needs to be regulated? Who are we regulating and to what outcome? Okay, th thanks for the introduction and uh, good to be here with everyone. So it's interesting when we look at um, blockchain regulation, we need to be very careful on how and why we regulate, right? We need to respect the fact that we're dealing with technology which um, in itself is meant to be decentralized and autonomous but then again we also need to be very wary of um, all the investors and the stakeholders which we do need to protect so uh, we need to create a fair balance of ensuring that the technology um, is left to flourish and do what it needs to be doing but at the same time we need to provide redress in situations where something does go wrong and we have seen and we are seeing issues with um, software development going wrong and then you've got issues of um, economic loss so how do you provide the redress for that and one of the things which um, which is being proposed and which is being looked into is um, granting legal personality to certain types of technologies so that when you have an issue that um, there's a liability issue or a rights which are being um, you know, not respected, then the consumers and the stakeholders have a proper redress on what they need to be doing and what procedures they need to follow. So going back to your question, we have seen um, many startups, many entities come to Malta because they do want to be regulated because it does provide certain assurances and certain protection, right, to consumers and to investors. If you've got an investor who is investing in a startup which is regulated, then you've got better assurances and um, likely to flourish in a better way. So um, uh, that is one of the areas which we are looking into, granting legal personality to these smart contracts and to, te to technology so that if something does go wrong, you've got that consumer protection element there. So follow on question, I am a blockchain innovator. I want to come to Malta. Is it any value here for me to bring my organization here? Yes, again, I mean, Naturally, you need to understand whether you want to be regulated in the sense that do you want to have a technology which is being audited by a certain authority? And if that's the case, then Malta is a place to be because we can provide guarantees and we can provide assurances to um, individuals who are investing in your, in your organization. And that in itself has a lot of value to it, right? So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Martin, I'll come to you. You work with data security and privacy, and we all have heard of GDPR is a very important regulation and you work with that. So I'm a blockchain, I am worldwide. Why should I care about GDPR and how do I even, how do I even adapt to it? Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, what we tend to forget is that ultimately blockchains are ledgers. So blockchain technology is a mean of storing data. 
And depending on the use case, but most of the use cases, they involve storing and processing personal data. When that happens, uh, data protection regulations apply. And the most stringent and the one that sets the global standard, which would be the EU GDPR, would also apply. The problem is that the way GDPR was designed and drafted is that it didn't take into account decentralized distributed structures. So what GDPR does, it always searches for usually one responsible party that is a data controller or a data processor as well uh, that may be held liable against whom data subjects may exercise their rights. And the question arises with blockchain, uh, with blockchains, with decentralized uh, structures, who are data controllers? Are they miners? Are they validators when we have a proof of stake consensus mechanism? Or maybe they are like apps that are deployed on the blockchain. So this is still um, a question that has not been answered. And even when we look at the definition of who is a data controller, it does not really fit to blockchain, uh, to blockchain technology. Um, what are the consequences? Is the biggest consequence is the legal uncertainty. So, as I mentioned, the GDPR searches for the centralized party, um, and it also allows data subjects, us, to exercise rights. So we can ask a data controller to erase our data or to have it amended. So how do we do it when the data is stored on the blockchain? If we, by the very nature of blockchain, we tend to think that blockchains are immutable. So an answer to that would be a very simple one. First, try to never put the personal data on the blockchain. This is the easiest one. But on the other hand, as I said, some of the use cases, they require personal data, like in, for example, healthcare, and a sector which is quite familiar to you, Pradeep, right? So an option that is considered is um, you just hash the data, you store it off-chain, and you put the hash pointer on the blockchain. Seems like a pretty good answer, but it's still not clear whether the hash pointer itself, depending on the way the, the data is hashed, wouldn't be considered personal data as well. What else is there is our public keys and wallet addresses. Um, similarly to IP addresses and even dynamic IP addresses, they would be considered personal data. They are not anonymous, they are pseudonymous. Because if we add additional data, for example, those data that crypto exchanges or virtual asset service providers collect, to merge them together, it's fairly easy to identify a person who uses a particular wallet. So, what we see, and I think the industry sees, is a need for regulatory clarity. And in the EU, that would be European Data Protection Board, which is the regulatory body that is composed of representatives of data protection authorities of all the member states to issue guidelines. Uh, how to interpret GDPR in the context of blockchain? Or maybe, this is something that I don't think EU regulator would consider, but maybe it would be required to actually amend the GDPR because both things, blockchain technology and GDPR, are unable to be combined. So, yeah, that's, that's a really, really tough question, tough issue, and I cannot give you a straight answer. We'll come back to that. The, I think the underlying question is, innovation doesn't wait for regulation, and regulation has to catch up. The question is, how much risk should the innovator take before regulation becomes clearer? Because ultimately, in every part of the world, innovation is going to drive regulation, not the other way around. But in Asia, that seems to be the opposite. You know, Hong, your experience in working with startups in Asia seems to be that you have to wait for regulation before you can really innovate. So can you share your thoughts on that? Uh, great question. So I, could, I, I think I could summarize that part on a, on a regulator's point of view and a startup point of view. In the regulator's point of view, when I consult uh, Korean government or I meet with regulators in Japan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, uh, think of this uh, as a business, uh, or the blockchain business as a cookie. You're baking a cookie and you're making cookie dough. But in the States, Europe, and uh, more of the, the negative, uh, negative regulation, regulatory systems, you can make your cookie and you could give it out to the people who wants that cookie. And the regulators, we see which part of that cookie is bad for public health or bad for the market or a bad actor. So they will cut out the cookie and say, don't make the cookie that way in the future. 
but more so in, the, in Asia, you have to wait after you make the cookie dough and wait for the regulator to come with the cookie cutter saying, this is a boundary you can do business. But the problem of that is, it's very safe for the investors, user, consumer behavior, but for the businesses, uh, it really depends on when that cookie cutter was cut. If that cookie cutter was cut like two years ago, three years ago, and the regulation is, uh, the, the environment is changing ever fast uh, uh, in the world, that cookie cutter, you have, to make the, you have to make a new cookie cutter with a new dough to change the business in Asia. So you have to put that in mind that the regulators in Korea and Japan are used to that kind of flow of regulation of new businesses. And most of the time, they're not really sure where to cut, where to put that cookie cutter. So you have to be, uh, bear in mind. But as if you are a startup that looking to go into uh, markets like Japan or uh, Korea, Asia in general, that has that kind of regulatory framework, uh, you have to be at the same time aware of the municipal uh, regulations, but at the same time, uh, we're talking about cross-border regulations. So even if you are a startup in Korea or maybe in Malta, uh, so as a fact, I won't state the name of the company, but in, uh, the company that made a DeFi platform in Korea got subpoenaed by the SEC, but they weren't aware that they had U.S. customers that would be affected in that kind of uh, regulatory uh, framework. So it's really, really uh, important to note that even if you have a really simple model or a simple um, business model of your platform or your company or, or your app using blockchain, you have to still consider the cost and consequences of breaching compliance. And you have to know the regulatory framework of how each continent, each country are formed differently from the US or Europe in Asia. Thank you. Dr. Kakia, you work with a variety of large licensed organizations here in Malta. How do you go about achieving compliance? I mean, is it even possible in the blockchain world? Um, so, yes, interesting points mentioned by my colleagues. One of them is um, the one Marcus was mentioning, that um, how do you, who is the data controller of the blockchain, right? The same question is posed when I, as compliance officer, would need to identify who the beneficial owner of um, the blockchain is and really and truly the answer is there is no beneficial owner so who am I going to consider the beneficial owner or who am I going to consider the customer and perform due diligence um, in terms of guidelines unfortunately these questions are still unanswered and even though the regulator especially Malta has um, quite an open arm approach and you can see guidance um, with the regulator um, sometimes it's a matter of taking certain risks, which you mentioned. And um, taking risks is fine, um, provided it's within your risk appetite, but then you have to make sure that, it's, that you have a risk management process, that you are um, assessing the risks being faced, and you are um, programming a risk mitigating um, procedure to mitigate that risk. Um, in terms, from my experience as compliance officer, um, I think what I gathered is that regulation is good. However, the implementation of that regulation can become very difficult. And sometimes there wouldn't be enough guidelines or else the regulation and the guidelines are very vague. So then it's, it's all about taking a risk-based approach, assessing the risks that you are facing, the risks that I would usually be facing from a compliance aspect is inspections from the authorities, so which now in Malta are kind of on the increase, and um, kind of you have to always be sure that in case of an inspection, what will the regulator be asking me? Um, are my monitoring plans, my programs um, effective? Um, how can I evidence that my programs are effective so that I can um, prove that to the regulators? Um, it's not just, the question is not just whether regulation is good on our can towards the business, but it's also the implementation by the regulators. The regulators should have more dialogue with the service providers on how the regulation is being implemented, how it can be improved and maintained, 
to guarantee a fair environment for all stakeholders, not just the regulators, but all parties, meaning the service providers, the consumers, and guarantee that level of protection, not just for the consumers, but also for the service providers as well. We're down to the last three and a half minutes. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to try to answer this question. So blockchain's core originating principle was to make the world a better place, to, to innovate, to bring democracy, equity, justice, access, whatever the mission um, statement you want to adopt is all about transparency and access and break down the borders. Now, what advice do you have to blockchain innovators in the audience? You know, how should they think about regulation? What is the role of regulation in their desire to innovate and change the world? Starting with you, Christina. Uh, interesting question. I don't think that um, blockchain innovators should look at regulation as being the enemy, right? Regulation is there to help and to protect investors. If your investors are um, confident in investing in your business, then they will be more willing to invest in you. So um, I think from a startup perspective, although I, from a personal perspective, I, I have seen that startups do tend to shy away from regulation, I believe that it's there to assist and to help grow that startup entity. Um, there are many benefits. I mean, we've looked into privacy issues, we've looked into data protection, we've looked into compliance, into money laundering, into taxation. There are so many issues, right, which regulation can address. So my takeaway is that um, regulation is there to help and not to stifle. You know, naturally, as long as it's done in the right way and it's, it, as long as the... Um, there are sufficient assurances provided within the adoption of the regulation. That is my takeaway. Martin? Be brief. I'll try to be brief, uh, and maybe I'll say something controversial within this circle. Um, but I would say that if we want to see the mass adoption of blockchain technology, we want to see large enterprises, large corporations adopting uh, blockchain-based solutions. Uh, this narrative that is concentrating on utopian crypto-anarchist movement it will not help. So my advice to innovators would be try not to avoid the regulation. I know it might be tough. And try to also engage uh, with regulators and convince them to amend whenever possible the existing laws. But try not to avoid the regulation. They will always, it will always catch you, whether they're here or somewhere else. Thank you. Hong? Yes, uh, another point of view from the, that I could represent uh, Asia in general is that the regulation has to exist to, for your business to exist in these are kind of regulatory frameworks. So I know the frustration. I know you, you think the regulation is being absurd in the, those certain environments. But I think for, if you are an innovator, not, be, not just um, within blockchain, if you're doing a new thing that wasn't there, you have to, in that approach, you have to be more educated. Like you need to educate the re regulators from now on because they won't be able to catch up on those technologies. And that would be my a few cents on that. Thank you. Dr. Kaki, I'll let you wrap up. 15 seconds. Um, so basically, I think whether or not there is regulation, I think um, enterprises should carry out a business risk assessment and um, create a compliance monitoring um, framework because that will guarantee um, kind of protection, not just um, to the stakeholders, but also to the consumers um, alike. Well, the panelists are going to be around for the rest of the day. I encourage you to speak to them. They have a wealth of knowledge. And I have personally been in the healthcare space where regulation is, is immense and varies by region. And I can tell you from personal experience that escaping regulation is not an option. Working with it, self-regulating it, and regulating your business in a manner that you don't get slapped on the wrist is the best way for an innovator to innovate. But please give a hand of applause to our great panelists and thank you for your time. Legal compliance with identification regulations. Moderated by Dieter Brockmeyer, Diplomatic World Institute.
with Adrian Dirk, Main Incubator, Lissy Identity, Pradeep Goel, Solve Don't Care, Frederick Lai, Jumio, and Peter Murray, Verif. Thank you for the warm welcome. We are running short of one person, but that makes it a little bit easier because we also have not too much time. Uh, we are not talking about a new token, a new coin, or a new service. Uh, we are talking about some a very dry issue, that's legal compliance. Unfortunately, we all have to comply with regulation, and that's a quite a difficult issue, and it's getting even more complicated because regulators are uh, de um, developing the sphere and it's taking extremely long because especially here in the Europe with uh, uh, all the stakeholders that are involved and so it's not an easy situation for everybody and uh, Panji, um you are in the finance uh, you, you, you do it providing finance services in, in the sphere and uh, you, uh, though you will be struck really hard with it, among others, but you also come from the regulatory space. So how are you dealing with the situation? So we are a healthcare platform, and we provide patient provider payer communication model. And there's regulation in every country, and in fact in the U.S. in every state, that's different. Um, so the real answer to this is that you cannot avoid regulation. You have to work with it. And what we spent the last four years doing is built a compliance matrix, a compliance mechanism that allows us to configure the behavior of the platform to each regulatory environment that we operate. Mm -hmm. But the answer is, particularly in healthcare, but in any other uh, regulated industry, you have to at least show the regulator that your intentions to protect all parties is there. Even if there's no regulation per se that dictates your blockchain, you have to clearly demonstrate the intent to be compliant. Okay, I'm changing it a little bit because of the time issue. Um, you are, uh, Adrian, you are really an expert in uh, wallets and digital identity. And uh, that's another very big issue, especially in the, in the legal space and the, to comply with. So how are you dealing with the situation and what does it mean to this really important uh, issues of, of wallet and identity. So basically, when it comes to identity, right now how we identify ourselves when it comes to opening a bank account or registering somewhere where we need to do an identification, normally we take a photo of our passport and upload it to, us, um, to a soft, uh, service where they run some sophisticated AI in order to make sure that this is really you and um, however, this is not based on open standards, open protocols, and it's, uh, and it's built on proprietary software. So what we need to do, we need uh, to construct a layer for the internet which handles identification. Because right now we don't really have a layer or a communication protocol for that. And um, this is really something which lags behind. And when it comes to authentication, we more or less have the same problem, right? We, we use passwords and uh, user um, usernames, or we use single sign on services by big co tech companies, so called login with Google, login with Facebook are prominent examples. So, when it comes to authentication, but also identification, we have the problem that uh, this creates some huge burden for the users, and these processes are not standardized or um, really customer centric. Well, and now, um, the Peter. You, have, um, uh, you are in another very important sector, uh, and it's, I think it's becoming even bigger with uh, all the coins around and the back doors uh, that uh, people can find to hide their money. Uh, so, um, so we were talking about anti-money laundering, AML, and know your customer. Uh, okay, okay go, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I think... Um if you haven't heard of Verif, we're an Estonian-based uh, tech startup, but we're purely and simply in the identity space. So that's understanding the people that you're dealing with, and it tends to be referenced in anti-money laundering and KYC, but identity generally is at the heart of everything we do in our lives, whether it's the healthcare sector or the gambling sector, which is what I, I tend to deal with. 
So, and we, we definitely think, I think it's interesting the difference between crypto and, and blockchain in this building and the gambling sector in the next one. It's much more tech savvy in this industry. And so the services like we provide and, and the same with Adrian is, is about that next level, a next level of understanding your customer because that's that the, the ability to do that safely uh, and compliantly uh, is key to the, the trust we all need to build. And I think that's probably the key word around that because the regulators, I, I agree with Pradeep, the regulators are the ones that I don't expect them to know everything we do. It's our job to work together uh, and get them to understand it and embrace it. But certainly from a, a Verif perspective, um, where we sit is firmly and center in the sort of document facial uh, biometric part and I think that's the futures because that's what the customers want the next generation of people in in the gambling sector customers are not going to look like me so it's it's about how we bring that technology in a safe and secure way to the market and that regulators understand it well it, uh, ALM actually is quite in well not old but older issue because money laundering is as old as uh, people tr bring their money to to safe harbors, and um, but uh, know your customer is, is in a new approach. So, uh, how do you see the um, the thing evolve, evolving? Especially, what will be the next steps? Well, I think for us, I think the, the the old style way of verifying an individual was time stamped and static. You would find me on a database once, and that would be it. This has all moved on, and this now has to be much more dynamic and in real time because my identity and who I am changes with what I do on a minute-by-minute minute basis. So it is around uh, having a much more dynamic approach to understanding that individual you're dealing with. And that, I think, plays into the, an the anti-money laundering aspect of it. It's very much about having as much data as possible that's relevant to understanding what someone's doing. So I definitely think... Um, whilst people focus on the anti-money laundering aspect, this is much more about truly knowing who that person is and what they do. Well, Pradeep, one of our uh, problems is, or when we, st when we start a new venture, is that in many cases we don't know where the uh, regulation is heading and since the process are taking so long. Is there any way to get more security for, for a company or is there any way to speed up these processes to uh, to create level playing fields or to make it more transparent and easier for everybody? So in healthcare, uh, and I think it's true in most industries, but I come from healthcare space, you have many identities. So you have the human identity, who you are, but then you have the clinical identity, what diseases and what conditions you have, what predisposition to disease you have. You have the benefit identity as to which insurance policy you might or might not have had. You have a citizen identity as to what public programs you might participate in. And you also have a family identity as to what kind of a support structure you have. And then you have a financial identity as to who's going to pay your bills. So you have all these different disparate views of a patient. And they're all in different systems. So I was an insurance executive, so I knew a lot about your benefit identity, but I don't want to know anything about your clinical identity. But I have to match them up all the time. And when I don't match them up, you and your family suffer. You can get care or you can get benefits or the doctor doesn't get paid or you're denied care at the right time. So there is a real human implication when the identities in different systems don't talk to each other. And those cases we hear about in newspapers all the time. Somebody was denied care or somebody was given the wrong prescription or somebody was sent to the wrong doctor. These are all issues of mistaken identity at the foremost. So when you think about the blockchain world, when you think about equity, justice, access, improving the world, the thing that we have to manage is different blockchains, different solutions, you somehow have to make sure that there is an individual who can control their identity and their participation rights. So from our perspective, you, me, our kids, our parents should control their identity and then should publish the requisite component of the identity to the chain or the system or the wallet or the program that you're participating in. And to do that securely is a great opportunity and a great challenge of the blockchain community. Well, Adrian, are payments a solution uh, for digital identity? He just was talking about the importance of the digital identity. So uh, are we having a kind of a solution here? 
could, could you repeat the question, please? No, the um, payments and digital identity. We talked about that. Yeah, so well, first I want to um, come back to his point because identity is contextual and that's a great point because right, um, when we take a look at it, um, then we're, we're all based on this foundational um, identity, um, how the Canadians call it, but uh, in the end it, uh, it highly depends on the relationship, the context of the interaction, so it's a great point. And um, when it comes to finances, then obviously there we have certain aspects as well where we have um, KYC regulations, AML regulations, and all that different um, regulations enforced by institutions which they need to control in order to make sure that their clients are um, yeah, conform of the regulation. And right now, for example, we have the AIDAS regulation, which is transformed, or which is proposed in AIDAS 2.0, where they talk about uh, wallets a lot. So um, it's quite interesting to see where this kind of whole space is developing, not only in terms of um, payments, which were uh, traditionally quite um, wallet focused, especially with the crypto ecosystem, but rather now we take identity um, and put it into the wallet again uh, as well. So basically we have the wallet um, on a, on a, as a user centricity tool, which manages not only the finance aspects of it, not only the, um, all the, the payment stuff, and um, maybe also some other crypto ecosystem um, interactions, but also identification and authentication. And once we have that all together in a tool, uh, in a wallet, which we basically give to the user as a tool, then this is really powerful and something which the user can control, and that's something which, which we need to build as a society. Okay, since we are really running short now, I'm also going to change my closing question, and I'm just asking, Quick round, one, uh, one word or sentence. Uh, the regulation, friend or foe? The what? Friend or foe? It depends. Uh, our regulation is necessary. Very short. It can be a friend, but it's most, uh, most of the time it's not necessarily. Okay, Peter? Sorry, what was the question? Is regulation necessary? <laughs> uh, yes, is the answer to that. Because this is around... It has to have trust in the identity space. Now, whether you believe the right regulator is doing the right thing is a different thing. But I think the fact is, you, well, if a regulator understands and do it, the, the customer, what does the customer want? They much feel much more secure if there's some form of regulation around it. Okay, and uh, your uh, assumption, very short. I think regulation is a foe if you ignore it or if you try to take advantage of one party over the other. But if your intentions are to create equanimity and trust, then regulation can be your ally. Okay, thank you everybody. It was a very quick round and I really hope uh, we had some information that you could take away with you. Thank you everybody and I'm now giving over to the next speaker. I know it's a good friend of mine. Thank you very much. Thank you.